So the genetic entity. Now this, this is the root. This is the sort of the tech part of the talk. Um, the genetic entity is a thetan that's in charge of the body and knows how to run a body and it gets into the body, uh, you know, right from the beginning and goes all the way through until the end. And LRH discovered one very important difference between the Phaeton and the GE, and that is the Phaeton can exteriorize and leave the body. The GE cannot do that. The only way that the GE can leave a body is if the body is dead. So in order to exteriorize from the body, the GE will have to kill the body. That is uh, an aberrated or interbulated genetic entity will start to unlock the body. Now, how does the body get sick? Well, the body, body knows how to get sick. How does the body develop tumors? Well, the body knows how to do that. It obviously, it's, it's, it's done it. So it knows how to do that. What's the body trying to do? Well, like with anything, it's uh, it's better to look at it's better to look at well what is the benefit to the person creating that thing that gives you more answers than why are they so stupid in doing that because they're doing it because it's the right thing to do like the model of dynamics whatever I'm doing is the right thing to do according to the way I think about it is the other part of that sentence but whatever I'm doing is the right thing to do you're never really wrong it's only your thinking that's wrong well, so well, how does a GE get in so turbulated that the only way it can escape is um, by dying, by killing the body and exteriorizing that way? So that, that's the, that was the key um, thing that uh, caused LRH to go off and discover how, how do you handle this. So the things that can aberrate a GE are well, any kind of uh, intense stress, you know, like abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, drugs, alcohol, um, a big shocking experience, which gives you a big shock of hormones, any kind of shock, uh, like big shock. And, and what does that do? That uh, gives the genetic entity an experience of something that it can't have, it doesn't want. And um, you know, the aberration on any subject is you can't have it or you have to have it. You don't want it, you have to have it, or you can't. You do want it, you can't have it. You can't have it and forced to have it. And the ideal scene um, within, on any subject is you can have it or not have it. But the G gets into a frame of mind where it isn't in that frame of mind where it can have it or not have it, whatever it is. And this is a gradient between mild mild and severe. Um, you know, you, you say, well, uh, why is it that people that are physically or sexually abused end up visiting violence and sexual abuse on others? Well, because they didn't want it. That's why. So they end up dramatizing. They can't have it, so they dramatize it. The body dramatizes it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of ways of looking at this, and LRH talks about that. But, um, you know, what's an allergy? An allergy is something that the body can't have. It doesn't want it, can't have it. Um, maybe it could tolerate it, but it, but it doesn't. Um, body cravings are like that. You know, what, what does a body crave? Uh, well, let's say body craves sugar. What is the body really craving? Well, it could be craving, uh, craving the sensation. Uh, it could also be craving energy. Um, the, uh, the body tends to, what does it mean to be run down? It means that the genetic entity doesn't have enough energy to fulfill its functions and starts to get desperate for energy. So you get cravings for things that cause energy or create energy in the body. Um, and the most important um, discovery of LRH on this subject was that when a body craves something, the body will never, ever be satisfied with the physical 
form of that thing. An alcoholic will never get over his craving for alcohol by drinking alcohol. It will never happen. But what will resolve that is to create mock-ups of the thing and shove them into the body, into the solar plexus, the, into your gut. And uh, that does, in fact, well, it repairs the habit. It's called body habits. So if a body can't have something, um, you create a mock-up, a little bit of it, feed it to the body. Create a mock-up, feed it to the body. Create a mock-up. Body calms down. The body can accept it, uh, can tolerate it. It doesn't react against it. If the body is craving something, it must have it. Uh, create a mock-up of it. Show it to the body. Create a mock-up of it. Show it to the body. This could be anything. I mean, there's a lot of things that people are addicted to besides, you know, sugar, caffeine, and alcohol. <laughs> people are addicted to violence. You know, they're addicted to discomfort. They're addicted to speed, you know, they're addicted to uh, adrenaline, they're just addicted to sex, they're addicted to shopping. <laughs> shopping. <laughs> Which is a lot on Hunter Gatherer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, I, I uh, a friend of mine, uh, Study these, study these tapes, and, and was getting such fantastic results. You know, he said, "You got to learn this." So, so I got the uh, tape set, and I started, you know, started running it on people, and it was very, very interesting. Um, and I ran it on people who knew nothing about Scientology. I had, well, I had one person, another person who was kind of low, low on the bridge. The main, the main thing, one that I thought was pretty interesting, when I had this kid um, who was like a he was not just a drinker. He was an enthusiastic drinker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he'd come in, you know, and say, uh, oh, and I blacked out, you know, and I said, well, you know, do you really have to do that? He said, well, he says, you know, I go to a party and somebody offers me a beer. I can have one beer. If I have two beers, I wake up on Monday. <laughs> you know, it's a serious problem. So I ran this on him and I said, mock up some alcohol, you know, shove it in the body, mock up some alcohol, shove it in the body, mock up a whole room full of alcohol, shove it in the body. Mock up. Just mock up, mock up, mock up. Everything. Mock up as much alcohol as you want. Throw it away. You know? He couldn't throw it away. Okay, shove it in the body. <laughs> <laughs> mock up a whole room full of alcohol. Can you can throw any of it away? I can throw it by the way. Threw it by the way. Hey, he can replace it very quickly. He replaced it. Shove it <laughs> so we kept doing it. We only ran it for about 45, 50 minutes. And this was like uh, right in, uh, right in mid-December. And he was, and then I didn't see him for about, about a month. And he came in, and I was very curious what had happened. And I didn't really want to uh, ask him about it, because he had some other stuff on his mind, you know. <clears throat> and he uh, started talking about these other things that happened, and this and that and the other, you know. And, and he looked down at me. Says, By the way, I don't know. I have no idea what you ran on me last session, but I went to a New Year's party. And I was all ready to get my drink on, and um, <laughs> he says, "I had uh, somebody gave me a drink. I had half of it. And I didn't want it anymore." <laughs> wow! That's crazy. <laughs> so it, it it works, and I and I and I ought to. Girl, this was the first session, brand new thing, she wanted to quit smoking, you know. So I had her mock up cigarettes and show it. <laughs> so she mocked up an ashtray full of cigarettes, shoved it in the body. I said, well, it disappeared. She said, well, the cigarettes did, but the ashtray is sitting there. I said, well, take it out and throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> so she wasn't addicted to ashtrays. So uh, anyway, so we did this for a while. and. Uh, she said that she was a two-pack a day, 20 cigarettes a day girl, you know, and uh, she said that for about four or five days after that, she only wanted two cigarettes. She didn't want any more. She just had two cigarettes, and that was it. She said, then 
I started getting a lot of stress at work, and then I went, I went back, and I'm back to smoking again. So, you know, so I think it needs to be done more than once and repetitively. But I think, I think you could really, uh, you know, and a lot of people see what happened with LRH on this is that he did all this line of research all the way from '53 up to '56, which is really the, the culmination of how do you audit a GE? You don't audit a GE the way you audit a thing. You audit a GE by creating mock-ups and feeding them to the body. It's called body happiness or remedy or repair of happiness. The remedy of happiness is if there's a scarcity and you feed it to the body until the scarcity is handled. And um, repair of happiness is you can have it or not have it. So if you can easily shove it in the body, throw it away, shove it, throw it away, shove it in the body, throw it away. Easily do that, and I do it on the meter so it's FNing. Then, uh, then you've repaired the, the body having this. There's an interesting uh, having this process on there too. It's just if it, the body starts going, getting upset or turbulent, you go, you know, look around here and find something the body could have. So it's, it was a body having this process that you run on the body. You know, look around here and find something your body could have. <laughs> anyway, um, so I think that's a, a very underused technique. Right after 56, LRH said, well, we're not going to audit the GE anymore. It's too important to go to OT. We want to go directly for OT. We're not going to audit the body anymore. And uh, so that whole line of research was abandoned and it was really never used again. Uh, a few people, of, uh, you know, myself and a few others, kind of dug it out and started applying it. Uh, and it's understandable LRH wanted to he said it's more important to create OTs than to create, you know, healthy bodies. But the other side of that is an awful lot of people have gone up the bridge and they still are subjected to body cravings. And um, this is a very easy way to resolve some of that. One of the things I, one of the curiosities I had, you know, with all these holistic guys who are on my lines, you know, they did a lot of testing, you know, leg length, you know, muscle testing, different kinds of. Um, I said, do uh, you know you, you've you've uh, tested a bunch of Scientologists of all case levels, uh, from OTA to, of course, people who never had any auditing. Do they test any different? And they all said no. They don't test at all any differently. Bodies always test exactly the same. Um, but there is a big difference because people who hire they are on the bridge, the more easily they get well, the more easily they recover shorter time it takes, the less work it is. So I think that's a pretty good statement of a relationship there. You know, and, um, Trey, what, yeah. just, just what I found with my own body, okay, and this, you know, I've done Chinese medicine and acupuncture for years, so, you know, I'm 30 years in my practice. But what I found with my own body is that the more aware I become, okay, the more OT awareness I have or I, I gain is it, it's it's not a matter of you know you can heal but it faster it's it's a matter of you can spot the actual out point and then go right there and handle it. Yeah, that's the AR, ARC, the, the awareness, the ability to communicate, you know, to have reality on what's going on. The less case uh, confusion is in the way, um, the better off you are. So The ideal scene is that you're not trying to bypass your body and wear the hat of the body. Your body is not trying to bypass you and demand things that really aren't good for it or you. You can get along very nicely. You can have a cooperative relationship. You can both benefit from your relationship and play the game that you came here to play with the partners that you've created, both intimately as a body family and your friends, you can play the game of mutual help and mutual survival. Uh, don't I take any questions if there are any. Trey, uh, Trey do you have any um, book that you might recommend for us to understand more about some of the things that you've talked about, about um, if your dreams are exhausted and you're, I maybe forgot what you said. Yeah, well, there's a, there was a several doctors that um, uh, pioneered this uh, 
there was something called the PAGE method a long time ago. Then there was a Dr. Bravanel um, who uh, did a lot of research on this, um, how people self-medicate by stimulating different glands. And how a person gets fat, by the way, um, depends on who is, is indicative of what gland they're trying to uh, uh, stimulate. If you're a tall, thin type, um, and all of a sudden you get fat around the middle, you're a thyroid type, it means you blew out your thyroid. thyroid. Thyroid is the most easiest thing to blow out, and then the body goes to the adrenals to produce. Um, the people that are like the blocky, blocky type um, people with um, well, like a kind of a big all around, more like adrenal types, they're, they're square people. And, uh, and people, <laughs> he, he, this Dr. Brown, he also pointed out uh, that people will always uh, exercise their strong muscles, you know, like, uh, and I've noticed this at the gym, the women with, with, with huge saddlebag hips and rear end are always on the treadmill, you know. <laughs> they're always exercising that part of the body, and their top of their body is real thin. But that's an ovary type, that's people who have tried to stimulate their ovaries over and over and over again. And pituitary type is like Richard Simmons, like baby fat all over. That's your, that's your uh, pituitary type. When you've blown out that gland, you, uh, you gain weight in those areas. Another little interesting point that one of the, doc one of the doctors I'm auditing now um, said that um, for women going through menopause, they often, and I have several people on lines like this, they often start to get anxiety attacks and nervousness and things like that. And uh, the reason why is because when the um, body stops, when the ovaries stop producing estrogen, the adrenal glands take over the job of producing estrogen. And if the adrenal glands are already stressed out, then they get really stressed out and you start having anxiety attacks, which are usually an adrenal problem. You know, again, this is, I'm, you know, this is just data that comes from these people that are very knowledgeable. I'm passing it on, but uh, that's why people going through menopause all of a sudden get a lot of anxiety, you know, panic attacks and things like that, because now your adrenal glands are doing double duty. But, you know, you just go to somebody and, uh, See what you need to do to build up your glands. You know, like uh, eggs, for example, are great ways to build up your adrenal glands. Raw eggs and eggs in general. Chinese doctors. I went to a Chinese doctor when I first started going into menopause. And they gave me these herbs to boil and flat everything out. Totally. I did it for about a year. Never had a problem with them. The Chinese said, the doctor said to me, Dr. Chang, so we Chinese ladies have been doing this for 5,000 years. You Americans haven't been doing it very long. <laughs> yeah, it's true. All, all medicine is trial and error. And, uh, you know, Western medicine is 150 years of trial and error, and Chinese medicine is 5,000 years of trial and error. <laughs> yeah, there's five major medical systems on the planet are Ayurvedic, Indian medicine, you know, homeopathy, uh, allopathy, um, witch doctor. There's a whole system of medicine in Africa and uh, another in completely different system in South America that are native native plants and, uh, and acupuncture and Chinese medicine is the other major medical system and they all have their uh, you know, values and they all have their workabilities. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.